Beverly Jo Wedipole, was born to Bernice, and Alfred Wedipole, in St. Louis, Missouri. She got married and became a mother to three sons, Christopher, Nicholas, and Corey Francis Gunter. Sadly, Corey was just a year and a half old when he drowned in a swimming pool. And after his death, the family was no longer the same. Beverly soon suffered another loss, this time it was her husband. Following her divorce, Beverly did not marry again, and sacrificed her life for her sons. Beverly, now 44 years old, and a grandmother, started seeing a man named Scott McLaughlin. McLaughlin was born to an alcoholic father and a prostitute mother. When his mom was pregnant, she tested positive for alcohol and narcotics. When he was born, she neglected and severely abused him, and he was cared for, by several foster parents throughout his tough childhood. As a juvenile, he lived in multiple foster homes until the age of five, when he and his brother were adopted by Louise and Harlan McLaughlin. His adoptive father, a police officer, hit him with a paddle called the Board of Education, and used a taser and nightstick, to discipline him. He also locked the refrigerator, so the kids couldn't get food. His few childhood friends called his house the House of Horrors. As a nine-year-old, he saw a pediatrician about neurodevelopmental impairments. The doctor revealed that he suffered from brain impairment, although he could not determine the cause. The kid had a low IQ, language issues, visual spatial cognitive issues, and symptoms of attention deficit disorder. When he was 12 years old, he started wearing women's clothing, though he had to do so, away from his parents. When he was 19, he was arrested and found guilty of raping a 14-year-old girl. Although it is unknown how long he spent in jail, it is known that upon his release, he was a registered sex offender. He then met Beverly Gunter, and the two began a wild romance. Despite being 15 years younger, their relationship progressed too fast. They quickly moved in together in Beverly's Moscow Mills house. Nevertheless, as fast as it began, it also ended. They broke up a lot, sometimes so badly that Beverly got a restraining order against him. Although they ended their romantic relationship, they kept in touch on social occasions. Only a year later, the relationship quickly deteriorated. And in the summer, Beverly broke up with him after constantly arguing and fighting. Apparently, that was a solo decision, because Scott was not willing to just accept the breakup. He began harassing, stalking, and threatening Beverly. He would call her at her job, as well as stopping by to talk. Beverly didn't like the situation, so she filed a restraining order against him. A few days later, a neighbor called Beverly's office, and said that she saw Scott coming in and out of her home, carrying things. Beverly told her neighbor, Scott wasn't allowed in her home, so she called the police. When Scott fled in his Ford Escort station wagon, police set up a roadblock, and chased him, until he surrendered. Police then found $900 worth of Beverly's stolen stuff inside the car. Scott was then arrested, and charged with burglary, but later released on bail. But that wasn't the first or last restraining order, so Beverly wrote many letters for her victim impact statement, and was ready to testify against him in court. One day before the court date, while the protective order was still in effect, he drove to Beverly's workplace, and waited for her to leave. He talked to her and tried to touch her, as she walked to her truck, but she didn't seem interested. She left walking, ignoring him, so he jumped out at her, forcing her to the ground, where it is believed he raped her at knife point. When he finished, he didn't leave in a hurry. He pulled a knife and stabbed her repeatedly, in the neck and back, creating a fan-shaped bloodstain next to her car. He then dragged her body to his car, placed it in the hatchback, and fled the scene. After driving to the river, he tried to dispose of her body, but he ran into some thick underbrush, along the bank and left her corpse there. The tire of his car had broken when he stopped to dispose of the body, so he returned to sleep in his parked car. Beverly never returned home that day, so her neighbors called the police to check on her, because they knew about her situation with McLaughlin. Beverly Jo Wedipole, was born to Bernice, and Alfred Wedipole, in St. Louis, Missouri. She got married and became a mother to three sons, Christopher, Nicholas, and Corey Francis Gunter. Sadly, Corey was just a year and a half old when he drowned in a swimming pool. 
and after his death, the family was no longer the same. Beverly soon suffered another loss, this time it was her husband. Following her divorce, Beverly did not marry again, and sacrificed her life for her sons. Beverly, now 44 years old, and a grandmother, started seeing a man named Scott McLaughlin. McLaughlin was born to an alcoholic father and a prostitute mother. When his mom was pregnant, she tested positive for alcohol and narcotics. When he was born, she neglected and severely abused him, and he was cared for, by several foster parents throughout his tough childhood. As a juvenile, he lived in multiple foster homes until the age of five, when he and his brother were adopted by Louise and Harlan McLaughlin. His adoptive father, a police officer, hit him with a paddle called the Board of Education, and used a taser and nightstick, to discipline him. He also locked the refrigerator, so the kids couldn't get food. His few childhood friends called his house the House of Horrors. As a nine-year-old, he saw a pediatrician about neurodevelopmental impairments. The doctor revealed that he suffered from brain impairment, although he could not determine the cause. The kid had a low IQ, language issues, visual spatial cognitive issues, and symptoms of attention deficit disorder. When he was 12 years old, he started wearing women's clothing, though he had to do so, away from his parents. When he was 19, he was arrested and found guilty of raping a 14-year-old girl. Although it is unknown how long he spent in jail, it is known that upon his release, he was a registered sex offender. He then met Beverly Gunter, and the two began a wild romance. Despite being 15 years younger, their relationship progressed too fast. They quickly moved in together in Beverly's Moscow Mills house. Nevertheless, as fast as it began, it also ended. They broke up a lot, sometimes so badly that Beverly got a restraining order against him. Although they ended their romantic relationship, they kept in touch on social occasions. Only a year later, the relationship quickly deteriorated. And in the summer, Beverly broke up with him after constantly arguing and fighting. Apparently, that was a solo decision, because Scott was not willing to just accept the breakup. He began harassing, stalking, and threatening Beverly. He would call her at her job, as well as stopping by to talk. Beverly didn't like the situation, so she filed a restraining order against him. A few days later, a neighbor called Beverly's office, and said that she saw Scott coming in and out of her home, carrying things. Beverly told her neighbor, Scott wasn't allowed in her home, so she called the police. When Scott fled in his Ford Escort station wagon, police set up a roadblock, and chased him, until he surrendered. Police then found $900 worth of Beverly's stolen stuff inside the car. Scott was then arrested, and charged with burglary, but later released on bail. But that wasn't the first or last restraining order, so Beverly wrote many letters for her victim impact statement, and was ready to testify against him in court. One day before the court date, while the protective order was still in effect, he drove to Beverly's workplace, and waited for her to leave. He talked to her and tried to touch her, as she walked to her truck, but she didn't seem interested. She left walking, ignoring him, so he jumped out at her, forcing her to the ground, where it is believed he raped her at knife point. When he finished, he didn't leave in a hurry. He pulled a knife and stabbed her repeatedly, in the neck and back, creating a fan-shaped bloodstain next to her car. He then dragged her body to his car, placed it in the hatchback, and fled the scene. After driving to the river, he tried to dispose of her body, but he ran into some thick underbrush, along the bank and left her corpse there. The tire of his car had broken when he stopped to dispose of the body, so he returned to sleep in his parked car. Police rushed to her workplace, where they found her bloody car, a bloodied broken knife next to it, and a lot of blood on the ground. They immediately figured out it was a homicide crime scene, and they started looking for Scott. Beverly never returned home that day, so her neighbors called the police to check on her, because they knew about her situation with McLaughlin. The next day, McLaughlin cleaned out the inside of his car with bleach. But he became increasingly hyperactive and nervous. A few hours later, McLaughlin asked a friend to take him to St. Charles Hospital so he could get some mental health medication. 
When the police got a tip that Scott was at a local hospital, seeking mental health care, they took him from the hospital, to provide that health care, in jail. Upon his arrest, he admitted to the murder but never confessed to sexual assault. Later that day, McLaughlin pointed the police to the spot where he dumped the corpse. Despite confirming the rape, the medical examiner was unable to determine whether it occurred, before, or after the death, so the death was ruled homicide, and Scott McLaughlin was charged. DNA linked the blood found in Scott's car to Beverly, and, seminal fluids found inside her, also linked Scott to Beverly. In court, Beverly's letters detailing the stalking, and abuse, she suffered from Scott were shared with the jury, along with the confessions Scott gave authorities. The jury also heard Beverly's victim impact statement, for the October burglary case. And Scott was due back in court the day after Beverly died. He was easily convicted of first-degree murder, forced rape, and armed criminal action, but they also sought the death penalty. During the penalty phase, the jury heard from Beverly's family about her abuse, and McLaughlin's troubled childhood. And after hearing all the evidence, the jurors couldn't agree that he should die. But in Missouri, a legal loophole, allowed the trial judge to overrule the deadlocked jury, and sentenced Scott McLaughlin, to death. Afterwards, the trial judge sentenced the petitioner to death for murder, and life sentences for rape, and armed criminal activity. Following a four-day hearing on several of the petitioner's claims, the motion court denied the rule motion. Again, the Missouri Supreme Court denied a rehearing. A doctor then diagnosed McLaughlin with borderline intellectual and personality disorders, intermittent explosive disorder, and learning disorders during the post-conviction proceedings. In addition to what Dr. Cunningham said, these pieces of evidence show that he had intellectual, personality, and neurological disorders, as a child, and as an adult. Under Missouri law, the death penalty is legal, but it is controversial. McLaughlin's defense attorneys filed numerous appeals, and the death sentence was vacated due to ineffective assistance of counsel. McLaughlin says that the motion court made a mistake when it denied his request, that the trial judge who gave him the death sentence not be in charge, of the post-conviction relief process. Furthermore, he says the motion court heard by denying his claims, that the trial counsel failed to present expert testimony, regarding his mental health, as mitigating evidence in the penalty phase. By presenting evidence that he raped Beverly Gunter on the night of the murder, and hiring a DNA expert, to challenge the state's DNA expert's findings. He also claims it was wrong for the motion court to deny him an evidentiary hearing, for ineffective assistance of counsel. This is because they didn't ask the jury about statutory mitigating factors. Instead, they also offered his school, hospital, and jail records from his childhood, and mental health issues, and objected to the judge's instruction not to consider them. Amid all that back-and-forth court situation, Scott McLaughlin decided to be Amber McLaughlin. However, he didn't legally change his name, so he was still, Scott in court records. Ultimately, this was overturned on appeal in 2021, and the death sentence was reinstated. But a year later, the state of Missouri announced that McLaughlin had exhausted all of his appeals, and was scheduled for execution on January 3, 2023. Clemency from Governor Mike Parsons was his only chance to avoid the death penalty. But a spokesperson for the Missouri Department of Corrections, said, that it is extremely unusual for a woman to commit a capital offense, such as a brutal murder, and even more unusual for women too, as was the case with McLaughlin, rape and murder another woman. And now, after Missouri's Republican Governor Mike Parson rejected Scott McLaughlin, appeal for mercy, the prisoner was put to death. The first transgender woman to face execution in the United States of America, was declared dead at the Eastern Reception, Diagnostic, and Correctional Center at 6.51 p.m.